First off, I love my kids. This is Learning to Dad. I'm a cool dad. That's, that's my thing. With Tyler Ross. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. I'm going to have fun, and you're going to have fun. Hey, Tyler Ross here. Thanks for taking the time to click in and listen to Chris Campbell part two. We had such a great long conversation that we had to cut it into two parts. I hope you enjoyed the first part. If you haven't heard it, definitely check it out. The second half of the interview is great. I learned so much from Chris and I hope you guys do as well. So without further ado, please enjoy part two of Chris Campbell. I want to get into one more story from yeah. you, and then I want to get into some short answers. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'd love for people to hear the story about how you were injured on the job. Mm-hmm. It's not every day that people get to hear a description of what it's like to be shot. Yeah. yeah. Well, which time I actually got hurt twice. twice. A lot of people don't know about the first one. So yeah. um, tell me about the it, first it was, one. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it was. I've gone through some adverse times in here, and that only played into the more of the of the doubt that I had about my dream. But mm-hmm. you just can't give up. You yeah. can't. So, you know, the first time I got hurt, I was, uh, I think, nine, ten weeks into an 18-week academy. So I was over halfway done, right? Yeah. And um, and if you know anything about going through an academy, the first few weeks are, the first, like, six, seven weeks are all classroom. You're at PowerPoint, PowerPoint, constitutional law, search and seizure, criminal investigations, basic, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Very monotonous. So boring. And um, we finally get to the fun stuff. And then it was like day two, someone tackled me, blindsided me, and I felt a pop in my shoulder. My arm went numb, went to the hospital, did an MRI. They said, okay, you blew your labrum out. Wow. So it was yeah. surgery a couple weeks later. Didn't get to move my arm for a few months. Was able to make it back to the academy. Finished up strong uh, as, as a class leader doing that. Uh, so that was great. Hit the road. Everything was was clicking. I mean, things were going great. I was helping out with all the community stuff. Then June 13th, we were at a, faci- a federal facility. I, I don't know that I can say the name of it. I won't say it. Um, mm-hmm. But we were at a fed- federal facility doing uh, doing some training with uh, our patrol rifles, the Colt M4, which most people you know know as an AR-15 style, you know, uh, a, a rifle. Yeah. Um, very powerful weapon. Mm-hmm. And we were doing some close quarter stuff, and, and without going into too much detail, uh, a round from another officer hit a pole that was on the range, and it came back in, uh, towards me. Mm-hmm. And um, to my left was Officer Eggers, who took some metal fragments to the face. Wow. You know, and then uh, I remember in that moment, I, I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm staring down the, you know, the scope of my gun, and I'm looking down, and... and I'm about to fire, and then I felt like someone just hit me in the chest with a sledgehammer. Really? I, I mean, it was just blunt force, yeah. hard blunt force. Not what I would have imagined. Not yeah. You think you're getting like, shot? If you think of getting shot, you think it's gonna burn. Sharp, you think it's gonna sharp, yeah. uh, hot. Yeah. You know, uh, stinging maybe. Or but, like not notice until thirty seconds after you've right? been shot. It was or something. blunt trauma. Wow. And it felt like something hit my entire left side with like a sledgehammer. Yeah, and this was a fragment. Uh, large so, fragment. So yeah. So basically, what happened was it missed my vest. Yeah. I was wearing a I was wearing a bulletproof vest. It missed my vest, went into the armpit arm opening area, and hit me right in the rib. I didn't feel you know. It's like at first you were just kind of confused. I was like, what the heck was that? Um, and I look over at Eggers, and he's got blood running down his face. And so we all kind of like started to tend to him. It's like what what's going on? And then I'm like, man. I just feel uncomfortable. So I put my thumbs in my vest like all cops do for a second and yeah. adjust it. And then I pull my thumb out and my left thumb, I look at it and my heart, my arm is just drenched in blood. Yeah. And at that point I tried to take a breath and realize that like, oh my goodness, my left lung isn't inflating is what it felt like. Yeah. You could. T- I could tell. I was like, wow. I, it, it feels like it's crushing. Something is crushing my lung right now. Wow. And I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. And so I started to, uh, you know, I wait for everyone, open my vest, go to take it off, and all the officers on scene, you could just see it in their eyes, they were just like, oh, no, because yeah. I was wearing a white T-shirt, and it was 
blood soaked from basically the top of my pectoral muscle all the way down to my lower left oblique. Yeah. Um, just blood just pouring. So I started to go in shock almost immediately. And It's uh, like after seeing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After seeing it, I look down, and then it's just like I start to realize. And then I remember my training coordinator saying, Stay, remain calm. You've mm-hmm. been shot. Yeah. And and then Eggers, thank God for him. I mean, he was there. He, he was a former uh, medic. Okay. And so, you know, he, he looked me in the eyes like, I got you. We're going to, you know, we're going to take care of this. Just, you know, ha- um, you know, breathe, control your breathing, you know. Um, so they walk me over to the staging area. They get my shirt off. They take compressions. They put it on the, on, on my chest. And, so and they, how, how big is this wound? I, I tell you, I didn't even want to look at it. Um, yeah. At the time, I don't think it was any more than maybe the half size of a dime. It okay. wasn't, it wasn't very big. Yeah. Um, but it went in, didn't go out. Yeah, and they were, and that was the thing. It was like everything started to bruise almost immediately. It was mm-hmm. all black and blue, and then of course it was just blood, 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 blood. So they they patched that. Remember, I I'm not breathing. Like it, it doesn't feel like I'm breathing normally, and yeah. I'm going into shock. Yeah. Um. You know. So they roll me over. They're looking for an exit wound. They're like, okay, we don't see an exit wound. And I just remember. I remember saying, I'm like, is that thing in me? Is like, is that, is this really wow. happening? Like, is this in me? Yeah. And like, stay calm, trying to keep me calm. And basically what happened, after, you know, was that uh, the round itself ricocheted off and came back. And then I took the round yeah. uh, into the side of the chest. So they, they, you know, said they radio for EMS. EMS showed up. I, man, I think it was like six minutes. It was fast. Are you remembering this? Yeah, this I'm like remembering this. Recounting. Yep. Okay. yep, yep. So I remember all this. And then uh, they get there. They check me out. The first EMS tech, I remember he walked up. He looked. He's like, okay, let me, let me take a look at it. He's like, lift your arm up. And so, and then he pulls the bandage away and he closes it back up and he puts it. And then he gets on the radio. And I remember he's saying, start air care now. Yeah. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Like, I'm like, this is this is bad. Air care is helicopter. Helicopter. Like, yeah. get get the chopper rolling. Like, it's like, let's go. So then they started. They put me on backboard, trapped me down. I was told later that they hit me with a, uh, like, a fentanyl drip, I guess, uh, to help with the pain. Okay. And from that point, the point basically when they put me on the backboard to the arriving in Fairfax, the OR unit there, um, I was in and out of consciousness. Yeah. Maybe four or five you times. Got like, like memories of yeah. opening your eyes and being in a helicopter. Right. And, and that and I think that was probably more damaging than the actual round itself. And I'll tell you why. I was I remember being in the chopper and the first time I lost consciousness, what what really made it hard was I obviously was I couldn't breathe. I was in a ton of pain. I didn't. I, there was uncertainty. Of, all we knew was that there was a bullet in me. Yeah. And I couldn't breathe. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was losing consciousness. And so for me, you automatically think worst case scenario, and it's just like, okay, I'm dying. Yeah. Like I'm dying, and I'm losing consciousness. I'm. This is it. Yeah. One and of so these you times s- I lose consciousness. Yeah. I'm not and well, the first back. time I didn't know that I was going to wake up. I yeah. thought that was. Wow. You know, I was like, oh my god. So yeah. this is actually happening. So you start thinking about things that you don't normally think about. Like I thought about my childhood, mm-hmm. and then I started thinking about, okay, my life insurance policy is in place. Okay, my beneficiaries are in place for all of my accounts. Okay, um, my I know that the the police department has all my paperwork for me for all of my, uh, you know, if I pass away, this mm-hmm. is how things are going to be done. This is who I want to do what. They've mm-hmm. got all that. So I'm like, okay. So I'm, you start running this checklist in your mind. Wow. That you never think you to go through. Yeah. But all of us officers probably do go through it. And I'm sitting there thinking about it, and then I lost consciousness. And then, like, I, I remember waking up again and, like, like still being in pain and screaming in the helicopter. And and then uh, and then it was just like – so this repeated itself four or five times. You know, at the end of the day, we get to the OR. They, they find out what happened in there. They're like, okay, you're going to be okay. They leave the round in my chest. It's still in there to this day. Yeah. Everything healed up and I'm and I'm good. I stayed a couple of days at Fairfax, went through a bunch of rehab. Uh, took about five months off, from, or uh, I guess four months off from you know working in the police department, uh, and then got right back into it and things are going great. I will tell you the reason why that that was probably more damaging than the actual round itself. And this is why I'm such a big believer in counseling, mental health, and taking care of your mental health. I'm I'm a I'm a crisis intervention instructor with the police department. 
I take mental health very seriously. I go to counselors myself. I have my own mentors that I work with mm-hmm. regularly. Mental health, it's such, it's such an important thing. I went to counseling. I went and saw a psychotherapist after all that to help with PTSD, to help with, you know, just uh, anxiety. There were things that, like, I could, if I heard a helicopter, it put yeah. me right back in that sinking feeling that I was dying. Wow. Uh, if I, you know, I drive by Clark Brothers every day on the way home. Yeah. Because I live in Bealton and, uh, you know, it's right there. I would, I remember sitting in traffic in front of Clark Brothers and hearing gunshots and you're just like, you know, you hear it and you're just like, you shake a little bit, you know, after this is happening. And it's like, that was such a tough thing to overcome because you still want to continue to love your family and to be there and and be that strong person for them. Mm -hmm. But you're not. As a dad, I think we feel like we can't be vulnerable and we can't let people help us. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the biggest thing that I learned through my therapy sessions was that it is okay as a man, as a father, as the head of the household to realize that you can't do it all, you know, and that you need to lean on your wife and that you need to lean on your friends and that you need to lean on on those that love you and care for you. And so I did that. Mm -hmm. And it took me months to figure it out. But, yeah, I did that. I leaned on the guys at PD that would come over and hang out with me. And, and I eventually got over it, and uh, and and I've been to the I've been to that exact range, yeah. You know, since yeah. um, it was a little bit weird at first being there, but got through it. Shot really, really well. Yeah. Um, the time I was up for there for our last qual, and uh, and and I can't say enough about uh, the job that uh, you know Lieutenant Carter, Acting Chief of Police, has been doing with me, um, and same with Lieutenant Cameron and and, uh, and Lieutenant Mellon. They they really took care of me throughout that whole ordeal. Mm-hmm. Um, Sergeant Moran, same thing. So I'm very thankful, man. It was it was a terrible uh, a terrible thing, but man, I've been able to use it to touch other people and to reach out and, and to talk about to further the importance of mental health and counseling because I use that. I'm on scene and I'll, and, and people will be like, well, I don't want to do counseling. I see that as, you know, they, they see it as weird or, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I just never want to open up. I'm like, dude, look at me. I'm a cop that likes to lift weight yeah. and likes to, you know, likes to talk back. And, and I, yeah, I'm a type A, yeah, I'm tattoos, a type A pair yeah. personality. I got tats, dude. I'm telling you the best thing that I ever did was to get vulnerable yeah. and, mm-hmm. and to allow people to to counsel you and to seek mental health and i'm telling you you do that it'll only allow you to be a better dad Mm -hmm. it'll only allow you to be a better husband and it's not perfect i still struggle with it every day but it's been the best thing ever do you think that that going through that experience created like were you vulnerable prior to that experience yeah but probably not not the not the level that i am now yeah i'm certainly more empathetic yeah. Now, coming back from from what how I handled scenes back before that, mm-hmm. I was maybe more stern. Yeah. And and don't get me wrong. I mean, if someone wants to get stern with me, I know how to give it right back, and I'm not afraid to do that. Yeah. But you know, now it's like I I, I think I recognize a little bit quickly quicker now when someone's maybe struggling from an emotional component. It's mm-hmm. helped me really bridge that gap. It's really helped me figure out how to effectively communicate with those people. And, and, uh, and that's been great. You know, if we have a suicidal subject, I love being the guy to get in there and sit down and talk to them and figure it out and get them to go to the hospital and, Hey, look, I'm going to be here right with you. I'll take you myself. You know, all that. I love it. Yeah. That's my thing. Yeah. Um, and I think going through that whole situation, it's only furthered my want to be that kind of officer, to be that kind of dad, to be that kind of husband and be that kind of friend. Yeah. So, it's been working out really good. That's amazing. I just hope man. one day I get uh, big and strong like you. <laughs> you Still like, working my deadlift uh, up to yours. Yeah, so how many uh, – you did, what, 3,000 pull-ups in a minute or something like that? <laughs> yeah, some, that was, something like that. It was <laughs> close. <laughs> that was amazing, man. Oh, thanks, man. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I raised some good money. How many pull-ups did you do? It was uh, 353 in an hour. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So it was fun. That is it was crazy. More than anybody guessed. So that's – more than I guessed. Yeah. So I, when you got a little audience and thinking about every one that you do represents, you know, yeah, it was twenty four fifty, I think, per pull up. Yeah, so it's like if I do one more, that's twenty five more bucks going to the boys' yeah. club. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Were you sore? 
Not as bad as you would have no thought. No kidding. Yeah, I, could, I had a hard time with my grip for yeah. 24 hours. But Muscular endurance. Must yeah. be pretty good. Yeah, it was all right, man. <laughs> it was great. But, no, thanks for sharing that story. Yeah. You know, a lot of people ask about it and, and how it happened, and, you know, I don't blame anyone. It's just a freak accident, you know, and, uh, you know, you can go to a range 100 times, and that's not going to happen. I don't – but, you know, even still, nothing's perfect. We as a, as a department uh, adjusted some of the way we did things and made it even more safe than it was before. Yeah. Because we were very safe before. I'm sure, you got to adjust to yeah. that. Yeah. But, I mean, you, know, you know, move the pole six yeah. feet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, and that's the thing. I mean, we, we made some adjustments there, and things have been really great. I don't think anyone's nervous about uh, – at least I'm not. I'm not nervous about going. I'd go back to the range with those guys any day of the week. Uh, I trust everyone over there. So I, I think a near – I'm going to call it a near-death experience. Oh, yeah. So it was. I think anyone that has an experience like that, there, there probably aren't a ton of people that yeah. as close as you. Yeah. So has that, like, introduced more people in your life? Oh, that, yeah. Like, you, like, wow, that's your experience. Here's, here's what mine was. Do you find a lot of near-death experience? Oh, yeah. It, yeah. it seems to – you seem to get be a magnet for it anymore. Yeah. So, like, a you know? theme that you all <laughs> share? Like, is there a – you know, something yeah. that's consistent across everybody's experience. Everyone, like, every single person that I've talked, and, and, and some of them have been cops. You know, we, uh, the Capitol Police Foundation, I've been able to talk to some of those guys up there. They helped us out financially while we were, obviously, as you know, uh, workers' comp doesn't pay, yeah. you know, what you normally make. So it was tough there for a few months. But they helped out a lot. I got to talk to some of those guys and all, other officers. There's a, there's a sheriff's deputy down Spotsy that got shot several times. And I think the most consistent thing is that, we just try to enjoy life more now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think it's too even too different than those that have attempted suicide mm-hmm. and realized that this isn't actually what they want. They, there's a story of a guy that jumped off a bridge, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, and as soon as uh, he left the, the handrail, he wished he could have had it back. And he survived the fall, yeah. barely, but survived it. And, and, and his whole story now is, is to, he just enjoys life more. Yeah. You're more intentional about enjoying your life. And, and for me, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's like I go out every day when I think I want to complain about something. Yeah. Perspective, right? And so it's like everything like that keeps someone that's been through a near-death experience that has made the choice to enjoy life keeps us humble. Yeah. I think at times when, like I said earlier, when I want to complain, when when you know when the kids are driving me crazy, when when work isn't going the way that I, I'm hoping it would, you know, it's like. I can't sit here and complain about this because I, you know, I could be dead. Yeah. Or like four years, five years ago, I would have given anything to be the parking officer's assistant. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, that's how bad I wanted to work in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And then I look at where I'm at now. Like, seriously, like I look at where I'm at now and I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like never my wildest dreams. Would I ever thought that the chief of police would send me out to speak to a group of kids about integrity or, you know, the chief of police would send me out to a group of kids to read or, Mm -hmm. you know, um, this organization would invite me to come do this. And and, and it's like daily. Yeah, I I, I believe it. I mean, I feel like they have branded you as like the face of the department. almost, And I think you're the perfect person. And and that's so humbling because I'm like, A, it just – Coming from where I was mm-hmm. and knowing, you know, what I, what I went through and then, you know, prior to being a cop, it just didn't just happen overnight. It was yeah. years and years and years and years and resilience and staying focused on, on what the end goal is. And, and now we're there. And then now I'm even thinking of, of different, you know, even higher, ex, you know, things that uh, goals. And it's just like unbelievable to even think that you're here. So hey, but. the, uh, the idea of the near death experience, I've, uh, I think it was Wayne Dyer that said that you should strive to die while you're alive. Yeah. And like, yeah. They, so do you think <laughs> like the idea of ha- that having that experience has changed you, made you more empathetic, made you yeah. appreciate life and enjoy it? Like, do you know anyone that successfully manufactured that feeling? I don't personally. I don't yeah. know anyone that's really been Just able to strive man- to. I don't know how. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know anyone that's been able to su- successfully manufacture it, but, uh, you know, I do think that there are people out there that uh, are able to walk with that same humble attitude, knowing that life is just a breath. Yeah. You know, I think, 
I think you could experience that same thing if you've if you've got someone that's been very close to you, a mother, father figure, or mm-hmm. you know, brother, sister, brother that absolutely loved life. Yeah. You know, and then they're not there, so it's like you want to honor that person by loving your life as much as humanly possible. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, the, obviously there are some differences, but I think that that's probably about the closest that I've seen to it. You know, um, one one big inspiration for me, and I don't mind giving her a shout out, is, is Becky Howdy over at Chick Fil A. Yeah. You know, she's been uh, she's, she's been there a for a short little yep, long girl. Yep, I've, yeah, yep. I've known her for ages just, just from being around. Electric she's personality. So nice. The nicest. Well, her mom just passed away uh, after a long battle with cancer, and that was her her best friend. Yeah. And uh, I'm telling you, you see Becky now, she's still smiling, still mm-hmm. loving. And I, I, I know that she gets home and, you know, gets behind closed doors and probably cries her eyes out. And it's just like she still gets out there, still gets it done, still. And that's expired. It's like, it, you know, she's like she is living her life because I know that, you know, I know that that's what her mom would have wanted her to do. They were best friends. Her mom smiles every time I saw pictures of her mom. Just yeah, same thing. And it's just like so – I think that's the, the, the relationship that the benefit of having that knowledge and relationship of death mm-hmm. is knowing that life is so special yeah. and you just really got to get after it. And that'll really create some perspective for the little Absolutely. Ones. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I, one of the biggest things that I'm afraid of is we got a, we got a puppy <laughs> when yeah. we first got married yeah. uh, in 2013. So uh, Winston, our golden, our, our, our yellow lab, was a year and a half, two years old when Judah was born. Yeah. They're going to grow up together. That's cool. And Winston will likely pass away when Judah is 12, 13. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be so hard. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, you just think about just different ways death is going to affect someone. And I know it's going to hurt him when it comes, but let's enjoy it now while we got it and just really try. This intersection at Waterloo and Shirley yeah. when I was – Six years old, I was sitting in the passenger seat when my parents told me that our golden retriever died. Oh, my goodness. I, can, I remember it specifically. And I think we have a dog also that growing up with our kids, and that's going to be more than likely their first experience with loss. death and loss. Yeah. yeah. And it would be interesting to see how we yeah. handle those things. Yeah. I imagine as a pastor you've handled many things like that, yeah. many people, many different you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I haven't had to do it as much as like my father-in-law or you know Charity's granddad. He's done hundreds of funerals, really? and I can't imagine. With, and and buried friends of Charity and yeah. and and students of his, and I can't imagine that. But but at the same time, it's like I know how I know how precious life is, and and um, going through this thing, you know, taking this round of the chest is only reinforced and and pushed me to cherish it all the more. Yeah. So it's awesome. Yep. Let's let's do some of these short answers. Yeah. So I just have a series of questions yep. and you know, I'd like to like to hear what you think. Yeah. And we may we may tangent a little bit, but the first one is what is on your list of things to never do as a dad? What's on your not to do list? Oh my goodness, my not to do list is is to really lose my temper. That's very hard is it? to do. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh I think if you've ever had a four and a two year old <laughs> by yourself and mm-hmm. it's just you know no one else is around i mean there and you do i i spank my children yeah you know i don't hit them but i certainly they get their spanks mm-hmm. i did too i can tell you that there were times when i was uh you know in 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 high school and early 20s where i lost completely lost my temper and yeah. it was totally unreasonable mm-hmm. and i think that that one thing that i never want to have happen is is my kids to see that side of me yeah you know and uh I think I've done a pretty good job with that so far. Hopefully, do you have, continue. Do you have something that keeps you from losing your temper? Or like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so anytime they they get mad, like seriously, I the one thing I do is I grip my teeth, I take my deep breath, and then I just have to think about what 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 how should I handle this if Charity was standing right next to me, oh, the great. wife. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like okay, perspective. <clears throat> it's probably a pretty good yeah. rule. Yep. All right, let's <laughs> take a step forward. Okay. <laughs> Honey, I need you to stop hitting your brother in the face <laughs> yeah. with this thing that I've told you to not do a hundred <laughs> times. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Go to your room, times. close the door. Yep. <laughs> you know, and I, so I can relate to that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's tough. It's certainly tough because yeah. hey, how, we're human. How long you let them? How long you let them fight for? Not very long. Yeah, of course, they're yeah. the same size, but two yeah. and four is a big difference. Not very long. Probably not nearly as uh, 
long as my my I shoot man I'm I've knocked my brother unconscious yeah yeah you guys are probably rough and tough oh you guys are all pretty close uh, so yeah uh we, me and my brother Anthony were two years apart you know mm. and, and at, at 16 and 14 dude we just hammered on each other and our other brother was probably 9 10 at the time so I mean mm. he's right there behind us so and then we all you know we grew up racing motocross so we weren't we weren't afraid to get hurt yeah. You know, so I knocked my brother unconscious once with a styrofoam airplane. You know, we <laughs> body slammed off of the trampoline, you know, um, holes and drought, all that stuff. You know, <laughs> standard brother, uh, standard brother material. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how long to let him go for. <laughs> I usually go until one of them starts to look like they're about to cry. Yeah. And then, <laughs> or until one of them gets hurt a little bit. Yeah. So what? what is your greatest hope for your kids? Yeah. Definitely my greatest hope for my kids is that uh, they live lives and have the reputation of loving others. Yeah. You know, that's that's my greatest hope for them because I think that's how you – I think there's this big misconception about legacy. You know, I – for the longest time, I was a big believer in – and I think that maybe this is because of the sales background that I had, that your legacy is that you were a successful – person you had the job you had the money you were able to go on these lavish vacations and buy these nice homes and do all this stuff and i think that that does have a a certain uh you know appeal to it even now you want to be responsible with your with your finances and stuff like that but at the end of the day i think my greatest hope for my kids is that they create a legacy of love and hope and empowerment within their families as well because that'll be a direct reflection of how charity and i raise them yeah I think that uh, the biggest principle that uh, I've learned is that you get your fulfillment by putting others before you. Mm -hmm. You know, you, for me, I I used to go out and, and I would buy motorcycles and, and buy all this stuff and go out and get food and, and, and hang out with my friends. And it was all very self-serving. But once I started to flip that script a little bit and really focus on others, mm -hmm that's when I started to really feel the life come When do you on. think you did that? Like, when did you transition from you to them? Probably right around the time I met Charity. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it was, it was was that, and, and right when I got surrounded by her her family, because they're very much like that. Her family is, is, is a very giving family. You know, uh, I do, shameless plug, Dave Ramsey Solutions. If, you, if, you're, if you're a money nut, like, I love being responsible with money. Dave Ramsey talks about being responsible for your money. Yeah. Financial Peace University, it's a great thing. You'll learn that uh, you'll feel more fulfilled the more you give to other people and less you give to yourself. Mm -hmm. That fulfilling, it's, a, it's an odd concept. But when you decide to stop loving yourself so much and start loving others, yeah. things like the hardships that you used to dwell on and go through and just beat yourself up on you that stuff won't matter as much anymore yeah you'll start loving other people and then you'll see that that is where you get your fulfillment from mm -hmm. that is where you're going to get your your hope and and your joy from is helping other people um you know and and that has really played a pivotal role in my in, in the reason why i do what i do with the town and with the police department I work a ton of hours. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable yeah. how many hours I work because I, I not only just do patrol, mm -hmm. which is a full-time gig yeah. with overtime, Yeah. but I also do a lot of community outreach. I handle our social media pages and, and I do, uh, you know, anytime the, the department needs me to, oh, I also go down to the uh, academies and I teach down there, mm -hmm. uh, new recruits. I do all that, but I'm telling you, that is all other people focused, yeah. right? I have my times where it's, you know, Charity and I have to recharge each other's batteries. I get mm -hmm. that. But the main thing is that my standard is to go out and love other people, pour into other people, because when you see them rise, I'm telling you, it makes you rise too. Yeah. So that's my that's that's my greatest hope for my kids is that they learn that principle early, that they, they love people, they pour into people, and then they elevate everyone around them. That's you know, awesome. Kind of like I've tried to do. So. That's awesome. So how do you how do you teach your kids to be resilient? So it, it's tough because I've got one kid that's really really emotional mm -hmm. in in judo, yeah. and then I've got one kid that just doesn't seem to care. <laughs> he's, he, you know, he, he's, he's two, two. yeah, he's do? two. Yeah. Uh, but with judo, you know, I think that uh, uh, an emotional resilience, I think, because he is very emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very in touch with his emotions, and I think 
Um, the thing that I've found that really helps me with, with showing him how to be resilient and, and things when his feelings are hurt or even physically, you know, it's like, is you gotta, you gotta remember that at that age, their, their parts of their brains aren't even engaging. Right. Right. So they're screaming and crying their minds out and you're trying to reason. They don't even hear you, man. Yeah. They're like, so you're getting frustrated because this crying child isn't getting what you're saying but it's like they they don't even they can't even compute what's happening because their mm-hmm. brains are developed in the frontal lobe area right yeah i don't know if that's the frontal lobe area is correct but it's it's in yeah the brain. i know you what, know saying. what i'm saying sure, right yeah so i think the main thing is 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 to make sure i continue to just get intimate with him on an emotional level mm-hmm. um and to let him know that i see it and i recognize what he's going through and that hey man like hey buddy like i understand that you know, this happened or even whenever like I yell at him, he gets emotional when he gets in trouble mm-hmm. and you know, perfect example when, when I spank him. Yeah. I don't just spank him. Chaplain Wally Smith at uh, the police department taught, uh, taught us this principle. You know, it's like if you if your kid has done something bad and you need to spank him, you need to make that the most intimate thing that happens okay. between you. And it's like I was like, what are you talking yeah. about? He's like, so what you do is you take your kid into, into you know, his room. You sit him down, you put your arm around him, you tell him you love him, and you say, hey, look, you're going to get a spanking. And the reason you're going to get the spanking is because you did this. You mm-hmm. understand why that that's not – you You can't just swat at your brother. You can't swat at your mom, or you can't say that to your mom. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, you know, I love you. You know, so – but, you know, go ahead and turn around, and then you turn around, and then he's screaming, no, don't do it. And then mm-hmm. you spank him, and it hurts him, mm-hmm. and he starts crying. And it's in that moment that it's really intimate where you just pick him up and you hold him now. Yeah. And you say, look, this had to happen because you did this. Mm-hmm. This is a consequence of your action, but know that I will always love you. Yeah. And you just hold him. And then he will sit there and he will cry in your arms and he will snuggle you and hug you. Mm-hmm. And he won't hate you for it. Yeah. Because I think that's the, that's the biggest thing is like you want to discipline your kids, but you don't want to do it to a point where they hate you for it. Yeah. Or they despise you or they don't want you to be around. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. it's like you almost want to do it and then they want to be comforted by you too. Yeah. You know, and I, and that's been huge for us. So um and I think it's helped him be more resilient as a as a little boy. And uh and it's helped us as parents um really know that what we're doing in our discipline is is intimate and intentional and that he's getting it. Mm-hmm. You know. So that's been a big thing for us. Right on. Yeah. So what do you think is the role of a father? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the role of a father is is is, uh, is obviously probably the most important. I can't remember who said it, but it was like the best the best way you can be a role model for your kids is to love your wife. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I don't I don't exactly remember where that came from. I'm sure people listening are like, oh, that's you know that's whatever it is. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the most important uh, thing to do for your kids is to be a role model that they want to come to when they need help mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying i love that there was a uh there was a a quote i saw the other day it's like you want to be the kind of dad where instead of your kid saying when he's in trouble oh crap yeah. you know uh i gotta call my dad to oh man i need to call dad yeah you know the difference in tone it's like it's like you don't want to do it it's like you have to let your dad know something bad happened and then it's like you want to let your dad know because something bad happened. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I want to be that. You know, that's exactly what I want to be for my kids. And it's tough. I think that's the biggest thing is, is the, that's the biggest uh, role to for me is to be the man, the person that my kids can always come to and do it without shame, without, uh, you know, anger Mm -hmm. you know and and to be that it's tough yeah that's that i can't tell you how hard that is because i'm an emotional person that gets angry Mm -hmm. you know and i have to control that but that that's what i want to be for them so on a little lighter note yeah who's who's your favorite television dad oh oh frank reagan what show is that blue bloods i haven't seen it oh my goodness yeah greatest tv show ever i mean it is a if you like, I mean, if you like cop shows, uh, you know, some of us <laughs> cops sure. don't want to have anything to do with cop shows. Yeah. I love this show. It's about uh, the New York City uh, NYPD com- commissioner. His whole family is involved. He's got a kid that is in the lower ranks. He's got a kid that's in the detective uh, unit. 
His daughter is the uh, district attorney. Oh, so, gosh. you know, it's like yeah. the whole family's involved in law enforcement, right? But it's very family-oriented, the TV show. So they always close the TV show out with them having Sunday lunch together. And, and absolutely. So, but that that's my favorite TV dad. I'm trying to think of what his name is. Tom Selleck. Oh, great. Tom yeah, Selleck, sure. obviously, a mustache, mustache that I only ever wish I could grow. <laughs> it would take me 25 years to do that. And I That's still wouldn't he never be. Shaves it off, right? Oh like, man, I still wouldn't off. be a man. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So uh, yeah, so Tom Selleck, and he carries himself with such dignity, mm-hmm. and purpose, and presence, and just he's a huge dude that you could just you know you just want to hug and and you know he loves his children will do anything for them, allows them to make the mistakes, allows them to you know learn from them as well. Yeah. So I, I would say hands down that'd be that'd be my guy right there, yeah. for sure. All you had to say was Tom Selleck, and I'm, I'm <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah. if you were writing a book about your life now as a parent, what would the, some of the maybe the name of the chapter that you're in now, or a couple chapters that you've experienced? Yeah. If I were to write a book now, I think the title would certainly be Love Others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought about that that so many times over the last couple of years. It's just like I, I really don't think. I've been able to excel as a person financially, even um, mm-hmm. in my work, until I decided to stop focusing on myself and start. I'm not saying to ignore myself. Yeah, you're constantly my trying fam- to improve yeah, yourself. My yeah, my family is is the most important thing to me, hands down. Yeah, I, I listen to audiobooks and read books for self improvement, mm-hmm. right? But when I really started to realize that life is it, there's more to life than just making everything about me mm-hmm. and my family and, and instead realize that, hey, live your life loving others and giving to others. Mm-hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change everything. It will change everything, man. Mm-hmm. I would say that uh, if, I was to, if I was to write a chapter, I'd, I'd write a whole book on just that. Yeah. Because I think if my kids see me doing that, we, you know, we, did a, we adopted a, a child – with our church in another country we get mail from him every other month you know we send stuff back Uh, we sponsor him every month monetarily and you know we got pictures of him at the house and uh you know i I explained to judah you know i I had a i had a great time the other week we got a letter from a couple days ago we got a letter from alex and it's a little boy's name alex and uh, we sat on the edge of the bed and, and i told you about him and i was like this is what mommy and daddy do we uh you know we send we send stuff to him we pay for him uh you know give him food and and we love him and, and we've never even met him because he's you know we want to love people and uh yeah. and I, I i hope that uh you know that's what what my kids realize made charity and i special is that mm-hmm. we we really try to love others and um you know we have fun yeah. Get, don't get me wrong. We, we we focus on our family too. We went to Disney. I bought a motorcycle a couple months ago. <laughs> you know, we have yeah. fun. Yeah. Certainly. But our lives don't revolve around me, 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 me. Yeah. Our lives, if that's going to be the legacy that I create for my family, it'll be that the Campbells love people mm-hmm. and we love others and we want to see ele- everyone elevate, you know, and we want to see people work hard and, and earn it. Yeah. But. That's what we want. That's wonderful. Yeah, man. And uh, actually, a great segue to the question that uh, Lewis House gave me. He's a podcast host uh, for the School of Greatness, but this is his question. And it is, when do you feel the most loved? Oh. Mm. Well, let's go. I would say, have you ever read the book, The Love Languages, Five Love Languages? Not in full. Yeah. yeah. But the, the the basic principle is that everyone's got a love language where, you know, they receive and they give love, you mm-hmm. know, in different ways. Some some people like words of affirmation. Some people like touch. Some people like gifts. acts of service. Some people like gifts. Yeah. You know, I, I would say that uh, for me, the way I feel loved, acts of service, hands down. Yeah. Like I, I could go like, like charity, mm-hmm. the way she feels loved, words of affirmation, quality time. Yeah. Those are her two big ones, Mm -hmm. right? For me, you want to make me feel loved? Words of affirmation. My, my coworkers and my supervisor will tell you that. Yeah. You give me, you tell me I'm doing good at something. I'm going to go out and get you 10 more of whatever (laughs) I just did. It's, it's like fuel. Yeah. Like you give me an encouraging word. I'm going to buckle down and give you all the more. 
Like, let's go. Yeah. Words of affirmation and, and acts of service. Mm -hmm. When, I mean, it just floors me and it's, it's humbling. Like when I, like when I come home and see the charity, you know, from after a long shift, spent all day cleaning stuff, putting my clothes away, making sure everything's nice and tight at the house like that. That's how I feel. Yeah. Like, I'm like, yes. Are you good at expressing uh, your appreciation for that? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think so. I, I kind of like to be animated about stuff, you? as as you can probably yeah. tell. So it's like, you know, when people you – know, we're so fortunate at the police department. People bring cookies and stuff in, and, and they love on us. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, obviously we – Chief Carter wants to make sure we take photos and stuff like that and show the community, you know, like, hey, thank you guys so much for loving us. Like, we want to, we want, we can't say thank you guys enough, right? So, yeah. I, I am, I'm animated about, it, but it's not, it's, it's certainly out of sincerity, mm -hmm. you know, because I see it. Like, we have, man, we have one lady that's been bringing us, a, <laughs> no one knows this. We got one lady that brings us a dessert, a cake, cookies, once a week. Yeah, has been doing it for the last three and a half years. I've been there. Wow. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I'm telling you, every time I see it, like, I, I, I get animated. I'm like, thank you so much. <laughs> this is so great. And, yeah. and, 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 and try to be that electric personality and to really let them know, like, this is so fun and thank you. And it's, it's just great. Yeah. So I, be I believe she probably only shows up on the days that you're there. <laughs> she, I will tell you, she she tends to give me uh, the desserts that I ask for when I ask for them. So I would say that, that that's probably correct. That's yeah. very cool. So, And my next question is Tim Ferriss' question, another yeah. podcast host. It's the billboard question. Yeah. 95, every dad on the planet's driving 80 miles an hour. You've got a billboard that they have to be able to read when they drive by, and it's a piece of advice, fatherly advice. Yeah. What do you put on that billboard? Be patient. Yeah. Be patient. Be patient. So are you patient? I'm not a naturally patient person. Yeah. I'm not. I mean, I I think that's probably why I get along with Sergeant Moran so well. Yeah. If you've ever met him, he's a very regimented uh, guy who's in the Marine Corps, and uh, he likes it done absolutely right now. Mm -hmm. Right? And I can tell you that if it comes to, like, schoolwork, I still get a little a little bit lazy about it. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. But if it's something that I want, mm -hmm. right now, like right <laughs> now, I want you to stop hitting your brother right stinking. I wanted it to stop yesterday yep. right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm not a naturally patient person. Like, I like, let's go. Let's get this thing going. Let's get the show on the road. Let's, you know, get this call done, whatever it is. Yeah. So, if if I know a thing or two about dads, it would be that we – you know, when we show emotion, it's different than when mom shows emotion. Yeah. You know, it's when when I discipline Maverick, my youngest, he's two years old, I do it differently than I do with Judah. Yeah. Okay. So I can say something to Judah a hundred times and he won't do it, but if I spank him, he'll do it. Yeah. Right? Older. He's the older. But mm -hmm. with with Maverick, he'll go to touch something or do something he won't and I'll just hey I'll I'll sit down, I'll lean real close to him, I'll get in his ear, and I'll say, Mavi, don't you do that. That's very bad. And then, like, I'll lean back, and you can just see his lips start to quiver. Yeah. And then you'll see his, his <laughs> watery eyes start, and he just gets hurt. It hurts his feelings, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's just like I have to remember to treat the kids in a way that will best – affect the outcome that I need. And it's going to be different for each kid. And the only way you can do that as a dad, mm -hmm. I believe is to be patient and to recognize what those avenues are and what those processes are and how each kid specifically communicates mm -hmm. and then adjust your delivery by that. And the only way you can do that is put billboards up everywhere. They <laughs> say, just do, just calm down, be patient, you know, with it. So, it's great. Um, yeah. This would be my my uh, probably my second to last question. I I almost hate to, I I not almost. I definitely hate to stop this conversation because <laughs> I'm enjoying it so yeah. much. But what's what's a piece of advice that you've gotten that was one of the best pieces of parenting advice? Oh, oh my goodness! I have gotten so much good advice. Probably the one one thing is, my father-in-law said something to me. Or said something, you know, I don't even think that he probably realized that he said it and it made such an impact. But uh, he said, we just need to protect that. And what he was what he was referring to was Judah is, he is probably the nicest kid 
little boy. I mean, he yeah. is just well. His little voice. He's so sweet. He will hug you. He hugs all his friends goodbye. He holds hands with everyone. You know, he's awesome. just the just the most adorable little guy. Mm-hmm. And I remember, and he's got such an imagination. And I remember my father-in-law, you know, Pastor Barry. He was just like, and we just need to protect that as a family. That's what we need to do. We need to protect that. Yeah. There are things going to be out there that that will rip a child's you know dreams away. That will you know happen to where he won't be able to foster that imagination that create we oh we we create an atmosphere of no don't no don't no don't no yeah. don't and man I, I think the only reason I'm, i do i'm able to do what i'm able to do now is because my parents didn't put those restrictions on me they let me be that creative and yeah. and really figure out how to play i mean they let me play drums for hours on end from you know first second grade all the way up until i got out of high school yeah hours dude i yeah. mean like i would come home and three like if i didn't get three hours of straight drum practice in a night in high school i felt like a failure wow i mean it was like that was the one thing i was disciplined in right yeah and so that really stuck with me it's like we need to he said we need to protect that and that was a roundabout way of telling me that i need to do whatever i can to foster that positive outlook, that imaginative outlook, that loving outlook for my kid, yeah. you know, and protect them from that. That's that's been the biggest thing. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's it's all, really it, it's, beautiful. It's awesome, and and I he's probably gonna listen to this and be like, I don't even remember saying yeah. that, but, <laughs> but that it, it made a big difference to me, and and he's right because there and and, and it's helped me in my discipline, yeah. You know, because it's like I don't want him to see that ugly side of me where I lose my temper and and you know throw stuff and just get angry and 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 yell and stuff like that because that's not protecting that's not protecting what he needs to know right now yeah he needs to know that i'm i'm loving and i'm a safe place that he can come and and confide in he's four yeah he should know this side of me until he's at you know late teens yeah and then he can start to see you know some of the more hard stuff and and be exposed to some stuff but for right now he needs to know me he as as a loving safe place to come Mm -hmm. as a dad yeah you know that because i think that's going to carry us later so that's awesome chris that's great so unfortunately this is my last question go ahead all right yeah so first thank you so much man i've enjoyed this thoroughly Uh, i have too absolutely thank you it's past my bedtime right now (laughs) but it's worth every second so this question is, what message would you like to pass along in the event that this recording lasts forever to your kids, their kids, their kids, and their kids? Yeah. Oh, I got one more question yeah. first. I yeah. love. I, I yeah. can't believe I almost forgot. The gift question. I yeah. love this. So you know this question? No. If you could give a gift to every father on the planet, mm-hmm. what is the gift that you would give them? Probably, uh, probably a counseling session with Wally and Pat Smith. How about that? That's probably a, a yeah. marriage counseling yeah. session. Our, by no means is my life perfect. I think that's the hard part about social media is mm-hmm. that if you were to look at my life like you have, yeah. oh man, he has got he is a thirty two year old. And he's got his stuff together. He's got a family. You know, I've had people come up to me, strangers, complete strangers that have found me on Facebook through links and newspaper articles or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, they say, you got the cutest little family. Like, you guys, everything just looks so perfect. And, and you know, it's it's Mayberry all over there. You know, you go and you do your cop thing and come home and <laughs> things. Just, it's Mayberry, right? <laughs> and it's like, they don't know. Mm-hmm. They don't know Charity and I were in marriage counseling for months. Yeah. We we put so much of our initial part of being married married into the church that we forgot how to love each other, yeah. and it just wrecked our marriage. And um, we struggle with things. Mm-hmm. So if I could give one gift to every kid, I mean, it would be it would be a counseling session with Pat and 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 uh, Wally. Yeah. From that. Mm-hmm. It would be if you really want to do your kids a favor. It'll be if you really want to do yourself a favor. You and your wife got to figure out how to love each other. You got to figure out how to be married. Yeah. You got to be. You got to figure it out. Because mm-hmm. if you guys don't have it together, 
it's going to trickle out into everything else. Yeah. And it's still, dude, it's not perfect. I keep saying that throughout this whole podcast. It's not perfect because the stuff that I am telling you that I figured out, I figured out. Yeah. But it's not a, it's a daily work mm -hmm. on every single one of those issues. There are days where Cherry and I are just 100, and I'm getting raw right now. They, 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 we are just humming. Things are great. And there are days where it's just like, I can't, I can't handle it. Yeah. So I would say that uh, my piece of advice would just be, if you really want your kids, if you really want to be a good dad, love your wife. Mm -hmm. And if you really, really want to be a good dad, let your kids know that you love your wife. Yeah. You know, we do this thing where I, I probably one of my favorite things to do is, is I fight with the kids <laughs> over kisses from mama. Nice. Right. Yeah. So I'll walk in and I'll say, I'll say, Hey Judah, I'm getting the kisses from mom tonight. <laughs> you know, I'm yep. getting kid mama's kisses and then he'll get no i want mama's kisses and then same with same with mavi they'll get all emotional and then you know it's just a big loving thing yeah so and and, and it's vulnerable it's very intimate and um you know i, I dig it that's so. awesome well i you know appreciate your being authentic and yep. genuine and open and sharing these things i think so every person that listens to this is going to learn something i've learned a ton I can't wait to re-listen to yeah. it and learn more, you know, when I'm not focused on <laughs> what I'm going to ask you next. But yeah. So here's that last question yeah. again. Absolutely. Uh, the message to your kids, 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 kids. Yeah. Put others first. Love God. Love people. Love your family. Period. Period. Nothing else. That's you awesome. do that, everything else will fall in place. Love God first. Love your family. Then love people. Everything else will fall in place. Work comes after all those things. Mm -hmm. Finances comes after all those things. You know, if if I could give one piece of advice, love God, love people, love love God, love family, love people in that order, you'd be good. Awesome. You'd Thanks, be good. brother. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me.